and welcome back to another episode of live here on keystroke medium i am josh hayes here with my co-host chuck manley and today andy peliquin comes back for what like the fourth time i think it's four although i'd have to say that intro that badass intro is new like every time i come on you guys keep upping <laughs> yes, it yes yes we like to up our game and then surprise people like every uh, i've actually got a new intro in mind that somebody's working on uh getting produced that will throw in the beginning of the show instead of that one and we'll see if it works out but it's gonna be cool um nice done. i'm trying to remember the last time you were on the show i thought it was last year sometime uh I we were talking about your there. your last fantasy book um and i don't even remember what it was called i was looking at it earlier um the one with the uh shield uh shields and shadow that's the one yeah well welcome back thanks for having me I, i'm really just trying to be the record holder here i feel like i'm close <laughs> For, for the most, you know, repeat guests, but if not, I, I'll be back on. I mean, you're definitely in the top tier of repeat guests. So. I would think so, yeah. I don't know where you're at on the top tier list, but you're you're definitely there. I'm um, just going to I'm just going to put myself at the top, really. I feel like that's where I'm going to be. Uh, rightfully so. There you we'll, go. We'll just put him in the top spot <laughs> until put someone it. disputes it. Yeah. Exactly. Somebody someone has to come on the air and say dibs and then and then you know, <laughs> Some, somebody's got to give them a sticker. We need to come yeah. up with the most guest sticker and then uh, supply that. And um, just like cover it over the forehead, just like right there the whole episode long. We should do a tattoo. <laughs> uh, welcome, welcome. Uh, Rick was not first, but he's second. And I can't see who was first because they didn't click the thing on Facebook. So great topic. Whoever said first great topic, you are first and you are getting the keystroke medium golf clap of appreciation. Thank you. Uh, let's see who's in the live chat today. Jake Lifton's here. Rick's here. Hello. Hello. Lauren. oh, Lauren's here. Mm -hmm. Corvo. Corvo's here. Corvo wasn't here last week. Where were uh, you? Corvo? I see Bard. Bard is today. Yes. Yes. Yeah, he is in. Leo Vaquero's here. Hello. Oh, guys here. Hi guys welcome welcome uh if you're just listening on the youtube channels and you've never subscribed do it because do it we're trying now. to get to a thousand subscriptions this year um when we do that it puts us into another bracket in youtube and we get to do some fun cool things uh we're close to 900 we're closing in on 900 uh, so if you're uh catching us live now on youtube for the first time click the subscribe button and then hit that little bell that way you get notified when we go live and you don't have to worry about it also we have a facebook group facebook.com keystroke medium come out, hang out with us there uh, if you're listening on the audio feed and you didn't know that we were live, which if you're listening on the audio feed and this isn't your first time, you obviously know that we're live <laughs> Mondays and Thursdays. Come hang out with us because the live chat is where it happens. Hey, Walt's here, but he's at work. Yes. Part of today says, wait, there's a subscribe button. No, that's only for the other people. Uh, let's see what uh, Chuck, what have you been up to this week, man? Because it's uh... been a hell of a week. Same thing I do every night, Pinky. Um, <laughs> Try to take over, over the, the world. world. Uh, no, I'm still clicking away on Jack Dark Book 2, and I got rolling on that short story that I was going to write for Wheeled Tales and working on Briscord Over 3 for, it's a year now that that one's been bouncing around. Dude, uh, I know pretty, the feeling. It's yeah. pretty sad. Uh, and uh, just, you know, Staying home with the family mm -hmm. a, a lot. Trying not to get the corona. So much. But I hear we're flattening it. the curve. I now. did a little, I did, uh, yeah, the curve is flattening. I did, uh, I did uh, hang out with Scott this morning on his little, uh, little show. I did catch some of that. And I think uh, myself and Scott and Devin are doing something tomorrow morning, but I'm not, mm. uh, I'm not 100% you, sure. You are. Yes. Oh, I, I yes. heard them planning it. So you're committed. <laughs> uh, uh, uh. I, love when, <laughs> I love when other people know what I'm doing yeah. better than what it's, I'm doing. It's kind of like being married, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Got him folks. He's nicely done his coffee. I timed <laughs> it just perfectly. He's choking. Every time. <laughs> if it's not whiskey, it's coffee. Look, <laughs> If you see me drinking, you can't, you have to just hold <laughs> off for a second. No, I don't. I really don't. <laughs> Andy, what about you, brother? What have you been up to this week? 
Um, coming down the home stretch on uh, book six of the Cerberus series, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm at about 87,000 words, 88,000. You know, it always happens to me. I think I've got a certain number of chapters uh, and the story is, you know, outlined beforehand. And then it just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. <laughs> like, I think I, I started this story knowing it was going to be about 28 to 29 chapters. And right now it's going to be 37. Um, nice. It just it's just the way it is. You know, the character moments, they take a few more words than you expect or, right. you know, some new plot twist comes up and you just can't ignore it. But but hopefully if all goes well, I'll be finished it uh, by this Friday, uh, about 100,000 words in the end. You know, I think that's a really that's a really good sweet spot is 100,000. It really words. is. I agree with that uh, because it's it, it doesn't feel rushed. Um, I've written several that are around the 65, 70,000 mark. And they, those books always feel rushed to me. And yeah. not when I'm planning them, because when I'm planning them, I'm like, how the hell am I going to get to 65, 5,000 <laughs> words with this book? And then before I know it, I'm at 80. Um, but I feel like you could do just so much more in that space, the 100,000 word space. And it doesn't feel like when you get to like 160 or 180 and you're like, oh, this book is just ridiculous. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. Mile 20 in the marathon kind of thing. Yeah. Well, you know, there's, there's books and there's books like that. We were talking last time about my silent champion series and the third book in the series is 287,000 words long. Like, like I was, I was six pages away uh, under Amazon's max printing limit. And I had to like, like no spaces between pages and just like, like I totally messed with it just to make it fit. But, but this is a story that doesn't like, it doesn't stop. And so like there, there was one part where, where a couple of people were like, you know, you could have, you know, chopped it off here and it would have been two, but really, you know, like the, the, the story elements introduced in the beginning of the book, they don't get wrapped up properly up until the end. Mm-hmm. So having, you know, cutting that book in two, it would feel like a part one and two of a complete story. So I haven't chopped it up yet, but it's, it's like the story just needed that many words because like, we're talking about a massive, um, uh, urban battle setting. Like these guys are basically their whole city is under attack. The largest city in their kingdom is under attack and they've got to defend it and, you know, push the bad guys out. And that's just like the last, I don't know, 20 chapters of the book or something. <laughs> it's a really good thing that uh, Sanderson doesn't self publish on Amazon. Oh, he Could you would imagine? Never be, he'd hit the page wow. limit. They're like, you're going to have to four books. They'd have to have a Sanderson rule where they just, you yeah. know, oh, it's Sanderson. Go ahead. Just yeah, it. just let him do what he wants to do. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's it's funny because you mentioned that, and I'm, I kind of experienced the same thing with my uh, Bring the Valor memes on. The third <laughs> Valor book, book um, because I get to the end of the book, and I'm like, this is really – I had a really hard time figuring out the climax, how I actually wanted it to finish and have a really good punch at the end. Uh, and so I'm looking at my color coded timeline here and about a quarter of the way down and I'm like, this is going to be where it ends. And then I've got like nine chapters after that. I'm like, still, oh, still going. Yep. And, uh, <laughs> That's the way it works. And it's, I mean, it's good because I, I like seeing the story carry itself, but it's also good because I'm like, be done with you. I'm done. Yeah. Yeah, and, there uh, there comes this moment where you're like, all right, story. I'm over you. <laughs> yeah, you better be done. Yeah. Well, and then I go back, and I was telling Chuck this earlier, to, to 287,000 words of valor, yes. Doorstop of valor. The door, yeah, doorstop. Well, I so I, I've written all this stuff out, and I get to the end, and I, I probably got like two or three chapters actually to write that I haven't written yet at the end, the, the resolution of the book. And so I go back to the beginning and I start thinking I'm going to go through a dev edit to send half of it off to Steve. Uh, and I get to about chapter eight and realize that I never read wrote chapter eight. And so now I'm like <laughs> going through and then chapter 10 isn't written and uh, chapter 11 isn't that. written. And I'm like, oh, I'm screwed. I'm yeah. screwed. And that uh, happened yeah. to me once. And that's one of the reasons I'm more of a linear writer these days, because if I bounce around, I forget things. Yeah. I cannot bounce around for me. I need to just like just work through the story right that's me too so i've been the last uh two weeks i've been pulling like 1 a.m days and i'm drinking coffee now at eight o'clock at night because I, there's going to be another one of those days but it's all for the good once the story is done i'll be done 
Nice. And then it's on to the next story that I'm going to be freaking out about. So. Yeah, but you said you're going to do some different stuff this Never. year. So. Well, and then, so to, to bring a really pro segue into this thing. So then I'm going to shift genres and probably write a detective story. We'll Which I am actually, I, I, re, I actually want to read that. So I think it's going to be my, that's the only, so my wife, my wife does not read my stuff. She absolutely hates science fiction. Doesn't she <laughs> hates Star Wars, hates Star Trek, all that doesn't like my books at all. Not not that she doesn't like my books, just she doesn't like the, the genre. The genre. And she has been begging me to write this detective story for yeah. years. And uh I'm gonna write it and then she's gonna hate it, and then I'm gonna just quit writing altogether and go be a <laughs> grocery store bagger at Dylan's or something. <laughs> but that brings us to a good point about uh, switching genres uh, when you've been successful in one and you've been successful in the fantasy genre for a while. Um, and actually I think uh, there's only a couple that I, a couple authors that I have seen in recent history um, uh, that have actually been successful in fantasy in the indie market specifically. I look at fantasy and I'm like, man, it's mostly heavy in trad pub and not in indie. I don't know why it is that just that it that's how it is. It's not it, fantasy is definitely not as popular in India as mill sci-fi is. Yeah. Um, and then so you when you see like uh, I can't remember I'm, I'm Brian Stavely is tra trad pub, I think, but the I'm mm -hmm. trying to think of the other guy. Oh, David Estes. Like you and David Estes are the two names that I can think of right off the top of my head that are you guys are making it in fantasy. And uh, you specifically have wanted to come and get into the mill sci-fi uh, market and write those type of stories, whereas I want to get into the fantasy market to go the other way. Um, so it's interesting to, to talk about this and then to, to go back and forth between the genres. You just had this book come out. Um, assassination protocol which is the first book in your uh, cerebus series it came out on the 11th so it's only been out for nine days it's still got the bestseller tag in techno thriller which is fantastic congratulations um but but i'm really curious so you're really really popular in the fantasy and you have really good series going on there what what precipitated this move over to mill sci-fi i i'm really curious about that so after, after I was the last time I came on, we were talking about the Silent Champion series, and that's military fantasy. It was structured like the story was structured around modern special ops teams, where like the the characters, like I, I loved the Rainbow Six series, so I wanted to write that, but in fantasy. Mm. So I crafted this team with you know the 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 kind of. Uh, personnel that would be on a special uh, special forces team you know you got the heavy gunner as a guy with a giant axe you know you got demolitions as an alchemist that can make things go boom instead of a sniper you've got archers you know like like it's all this kind of fun stuff but when i was coming to the end of that series i was actually struggling with the last book which came out um april 6th um i, I was working on it in um august september of last year and it was just like pulling teeth the story it's basically a 300 slash chain of dog story where it's literally one long hundred mile march till everybody dies and how can you make a straight line interesting you know yeah. a straight march so it was like it was super difficult for me to get this story done and i was struggling and so the first time ever in my author career i was like all right i'm gonna put this book aside and i'm gonna go write something else that makes you know it's more interesting and as I was kind of kicking around ideas for a story, this assassin character popped into my head. And I've, I've, I've had this idea for an assassin character in sci-fi for three or four years, but I just haven't found the right story to tell. So I was like, all right, I want to write another assassin. I already have one series about an assassin. Assassins feature prominently in another series. Like every one of my fantasy series has assassins to some degree. So I was like, if I want to write this, to make it unique and interesting, I can't really play with fantasy anymore. I've got to go somewhere else. And so this idea yeah. of the assassin character, it just fit perfectly within sci-fi because a lot of the research that I'd been doing was from someone who, who has actually, you know, on a special forces team as a sniper, um, all of their experiences. So basically I could, I could craft this whole story based on everything that they'd told me about their experiences, about their skill set, everything. 
um, and just bring it to life instead of having to, you know, try to come up with some new super um, unique twist on fantasy assassins in a way that hasn't been done by me and, you know, Mark Lawrence and Justin DePauli and all the other people who write badass assassins right. going to sci-fi. I didn't see that many fantasy, as I mean, uh, sci-fi assassins, especially sci-fi assassins who happen to be snipers and really playing on the sniper thing. That's one thing that I haven't seen a lot of is snipers actually being uh, portrayed what they do as snipers. Yeah, I, I have to agree with you because I think a lot of the um, books are are structured in a way that you can be claustrophobic and then the character has to do a lot of hand to hand but action stuff like as a sniper right. you're way back away from the action you, you you're not going to be uh kneeing people in the throat and all that stuff a lot of the time so that's yeah. interesting and as and you know that for me as an author it's all about sort of pushing myself to write something new so my first series was a half demon assassin a bad guy as the main character that's something different my right. second character was uh, a, a woman thief something you know that i've no experience with and then i went with young adult and then going military and so this was sort of the new the new way to go where it's like i have never read i have never seen personally in sci-fi or in in many thrillers a sniper as the main character and where you really dive into everything that he goes through and like you said being behind the scope a thousand meters out it feels like it's really difficult to create tension in that kind of scene so as, as an author for me that challenge is how can i make this character this long range character where often he's got no chance of being fired back on right no one's ever going to know he's there because of his training so it's it's a really fun sort of balance to strike between immediate tension and then still playing with that super super long distance and the the sniper aspect is cool because you can do a lot of things with tech where um it's not just uh explosions you can do a lot of cool things with stealth tech and stealth uh weaponry that you can't do other otherwise and uh, i like that you took it from fantasy because there are a lot of uh, and i think there are a lot of grim dark fantasies that have to deal with that um do you is this more of a darker sci-fi or do you make it um uh do you have a lot of levity in it or is it does it delve deep because i mean if you're talking about an assassin and uh in the general word in the general sense of the word uh they're, they're not going to be very happy people <laughs> no <laughs> uh so how did you go about creating the character for that and it it, it does it kind of delve into the darker side of mill sci-fi or or were you even aware of that when you wrote it it delves into the darker side of what it means to be a a soldier or a, you know a Oh, that's a great. Oh, meme somebody shot. meme that. Meme that. If you're not yeah, memeing meme that, that. You're doing it wrong. You just froze up a little bit. Don't worry about it. Sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah, this it, whole, it usually uh, happens uh, to Chuck, but when it happens to our guests, we have to meme it. <laughs> Bill, where are you? That's totally cool. <laughs> um, so I done all this research into snipers, and it was like, all right, this is this is the story I want to tell because I I wanted to do something unique. And then as I was thinking, okay, what kind of person would this sniper be? It just kind of made sense more to go with the military, you know, like a special forces team. But sure. then why why isn't he in the special forces anymore? How did he become? How did he go from? you know, special forces to assassin. And then it came, the idea of being a paraplegic came up where he took a, he took shrapnel to the spine and now his legs don't, you know, he got meted out because he can't walk. And that right there was like, okay, this is super interesting because you've got this, this dichotomy. He's got this AI implanted in his brain that connects his brain's movements, you know, the, the neuro electrical signals to his armor. And so his armor does the movements for him, but you take him out of his armor or you disconnect the AI or you put him somewhere where, you know, an EMP just fragged his suit. All of a sudden he's paraplegic again. So you have this nice. really, really interesting, you know, balance. And, and as someone, someone mentioned, you know, a guy with this, with a rifle, even if he doesn't have legs, he's still a guy with a rifle. And so it's so interesting for me to be able to play with that of you take away his legs. You still got all of those skills. He ain't got and no he can legs. Do all of that. Exactly. And so being able to play with this balance of the paraplegic and and then of course he's a total badass when he's in his armor, 
he is just like at you know he is he is who he was during his former elite special forces days even more so because he's got this ai in his brain and super high-tech armor like sort of tony stark but if tony stark's armor was worn by the punisher essentially <laughs> <laughs> nice wow <laughs> and then and then sort of playing off of that it was like okay now after he gets meted out of the army um how does that affect him and and someone mentioned that drug addiction is super common as i was doing research and i was like okay let's play with that let's let's go in that direction so he he basically was about to drug himself to death and then in the prequel story which was a freebie on my website uh someone sort of pulls him out of it cleans him up and so in book one um in the blurb it mentions that he finds this former silver guard this a former special forces like him on his doorstep drugged out of her mind and so his whole thing is that he's going to help her clean up just like this other person helped him clean up and of course that starts the whole you know series of of you know adventures and stuff but that's you know being able to play with that like the whole book five that i just finished a few weeks ago um was this character going back to all of the places where you know where she was descending into heavy drug uh, abuse and addiction and then you know in in book six he reunites with his old team and they're all going out for a drink but he knows that drink is a trigger for drug abuse so it's like like being able to bring that into the story in interesting ways and, and sort of showing this character's journey has been the most interesting part for me and that's what really keeps me engaged in the story I think characters, regardless of genre, if it, you you have to have compelling and and uh, likable and under like characters that you can empathize with, um, and I don't know that everybody can empathize as a sniper assassin, but everybody um, can empathize with you know a regular person who's dealing with regular stuff, whether it's drug addiction or some type of disability or you know being forced out of a job that you love for reasons that aren't. Uh, for things that you can't help right. um i think everybody can uh, uh see and and be like picture themselves in that situation i think that's what's critical about character driven stories like this yeah, um, nothing's more, more humanizing than a loss of control yeah, yeah. oh know? yeah 100%. you know that 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 is that's like the lowest common denominator because you know everybody likes to spout this whole everything's a choice crap but Nobody chooses to get cancer. Nobody chooses to yeah. become a paraplegic, you know? Right. So I think that is, that is a definite uh, equalizing factor when you've got a character who's such a killing machine like this guy obviously is. Yeah. And then uh, one, the last thing that sort of humanizes him as a character is that he's doing these, these hits because the sort of CIA esque organization, they call themselves the protection bureau, which is about as, you know, as CIA I like gets, I like um, they are getting him access to his brother who's in like maximum security prison. He's been there for about a year and a half or something. And he's been unable to get any information on his brother, you know, his charges, anything like that. So by doing these various hits for the protection bureau, he gets access. They set up a, a, a date to visit his brother, you know, in prison. Right. And, like, and so that's like between all of these things, um, it's so much easier to humanize him because there's all of these different elements that make him so interesting well, because he's doing it for reasons, right? It's exactly. like watching, right. uh, it's like watching breaking bad. And if you didn't have the context of his cancer and his family, and you're just watching it as this guy's a drug kingpin monster murderer, like you wouldn't empathize with Walter White. But when you see it from the context of he's got all this other stuff going on, you can empathize with that and be right. like, yes, I get why you did it, man. man. <laughs> yeah. And also for this series, like in other series, I've really, really tried to toe the line between, you know, the shades of gray where, where, you know, who's the actual bad person or things like that with this one. It's just much more like, you know, not good versus bad, but there is a very clear reason why he, you know, he takes out everybody that he takes out. Um, just, just to sort of simplify things instead of, you know, delving into the morality of, of the assassination aspects of it all, you delve it like the focus is on the other, the other things, yeah. um, about, you know, him, his battle with addiction, his journey to recovery, how he helps this other person also, you know, go down their process and, and his, you know, his struggle with paraplegia and, you know, how it, how it, he interacts with the world as someone who went from really an apex predator to you know he was die he was dying on the streets 
so he could get his fix. And it's such an interesting dynamic for me to explore through the story. Yeah. It's cool. I'm, I'm curious about, um, going from the, the 230,000 word tome that you wrote <laughs> in that fantasy to, you know, this mill sci-fi where mill sci-fi, when you look at the genre is typically between 70 and a hundred K. Um, was it difficult for you to, after writing so many words and, and a lot of fantasy, you can be kind of more poetic than you can be in mill sci-fi. And um, you have a lot more room to just play with things like character and world building and that kind of thing. Uh, was it hard to, to pair a lot of that out when you made this swap? And what was the hardest thing that you worked on to, to, to go from writing the, the large epic fantasy to the, the shorter mill sci-fi? Well, you know, the for me, the thing that always drives it is the story, sort of the story that I want to tell in each book. And so before I sat down to write each of the books that I've written in the series so far, I kind of had an idea of what the story was that I wanted to tell. And I purposely made it shorter, knowing that I had, a you know, like a lot of readers aren't going to be good with over 110,000 words. That's probably pushing it too far for military sci-fi. Yeah. Um, so just, just structuring a story that's that that sort of gets to the point a little faster or, you know, the cycles between the opening, the problem and closing it at the end of the book, they're shorter. Whereas in fantasy, you know, I, I, I could take more time um, developing things. And, and especially the one thing that I noticed about fantasy is that you have to spend a lot more time in the world building aspect. Whereas mm -hmm. in sci-fi, you don't really have to, uh, you can kind of get away with, with generic names and people's brains, they fill in the details a lot more easily. Yeah. And and uh, William Tyler, Tyler Davis says probably less POVs too in the uh, in the, the presentation of the story. Well, I'm I I tried multiple point of views one time, one series, hated it. So it, like bouncing between brains, I hate it. So uh, three of my series, three of my fantasy series are single pov and this mill sci-fi one is single pov and it's also you know it's third person i mm -hmm. don't do the the first person thing but i you know it, but just yeah just shrinking the story that i'm trying to tell instead of this big world spanning thing just focusing on the one you know aspect of this character's story and i have you know i can do more books i've got 12 books planned for the series so i've got plenty of time i think we need to take a minute to talk about rick's quarantine uh thing that he's doing uh rick i my hat off to you sir he's doing a, a, sh a shot of tequila every night one, <laughs> one, shot. one per night until the lockdown is over and that is legit i salute you sir because that's pretty cool <laughs> i was uh, I would... gonna go back to one shot once the yeah I... yeah I'd get the one and then two and then James says 37 shots, Rick. <laughs> 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 Nicely done. Uh, before we continue on, let's talk about the show sponsor for this night's episode. Let's see. Where are we at? Boom. There we go. It's I am mech by Jonathan Yanez and Steve Collier. Uh, we met Steve actually um, in Vegas at uh, 20 books this year. Where did that go? Oh, there it is. It's right there. Uh, and uh, Jonathan Yanni is they. Uh, I don't know that we've had Stevie on the show. I can't remember if we've actually had him on. You'd remember Stevie. Stevie's I've been on your show. Very, yeah, Stevie's a very memorable person. <laughs> uh, I like his green screen um with all the different backgrounds that he put on all right so this is i am mech a mecha space opera adventure metal fury book one by jonathan yanez and steve collier his job was to dig for resources but now he's unearthed a sinister plot to stop this encroaching doom, doom. <laughs> the people cry out for a hero instead they get jack this ace mech pilot contends with legendary prophecies ancient powers and fickle companions as he sets out on an epic task to save his planet from a baddie hell-bent on <laughs> destruction his has his positive self-talk got him in too deep or will he actually pull through 
to do some good this time. I am Mech is a nonstop roller coaster ride of adventure full of snarky humor and more than a few spit out of your drink, spit, spit out your drink moments of doom. Doom. Or fans of the original uh, Gateway to the Galaxy and Guardians of the Galaxy or anything else with the word galaxy, download it now for an entertaining good gun. That was, you know, there's very few times where I've read a description and laughed while and I was had reading. fun with it. Yeah. And that was really good. That, that was a really good uh, description. I'm going to put the uh, link in the live chat. And you guys can pick it up at your leisure, and it'll be in the show notes as well. Go pick it up and give it a read. I am Mech by Jonathan Yanez and Steve. It's, that's a really cool cover. I don't know if you guys can see it. Let me get this rid of this. Uh, da, da, da. It's Stevie's classic ridiculous humor. I mean, that's a pretty legit cover. I really, really like is. that. Mech of Valor. Yes, that's true. <laughs> Mech of Valor. Uh, okay, let's uh, boop. There we go. And I just want to pat myself on the back because I did a really awesome ad read just then. It was Thank you guys. Thank you. I mean, you don't have to tell me. I know that it was great. <laughs> Cuervo of Valor. <laughs> Jail <J> <laughs> <Larry. laughs> Yeah, that's right. One shot of Valor. One shot of Valor every day until the quarantine's over. Which that's what it feels like. <laughs> 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 uh okay so another thing i wanted to i was curious about uh in the genre switching is uh, and and i actually came up against this a couple months back when i went i took a break and was uh um doing a part of a screenplay for this detective thing that i was uh thinking about working on and the way that they the characters talk obviously is different. Um, same thing with fantasy to uh, mill oh, sci-fi. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and I know that you did a lot of research just for the the military aspect of the book and, and the technology aspect of the book. Um, but how was it working out how the different characters talk from fantasy to uh, mill sci-fi? You know, it's it's actually easier, I think, to make the transition from fantasy to any modern genre because, I mean, it's how we talk. You know, we talk like Indeed. normal modern people. So going from any modern genre to fantasy, I feel would be harder. Um, but, but you know, like, like it's taken me a lot of time to get into sort of the, the very not, it's not aggressive, but it's a very sort of like blunt and sharp way of talking that, that soldiers have, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's, it's a, exactly. And, you know, really, really good jokes and nasty jokes and just like, like horrible things said in just a total deadpan thing. And I love it that, you know, that is one of the things that drew me to the genre more than anything else is just that, that snarky humor and just total irrelevance. Like, like the character, um, in the in the prequel, when she's you know one of the characters, she finds him in the mud, and she's just like cracking jokes about his legs, you know that his legs don't <laughs> yeah. work, and and you know on the second one, she's he's like, all right, you get one more of those, and then I'm gonna <laughs> kick your ass, right? And you know, and then and she gives him a look like, kick my ass, you know, just like being right. able to do stuff like that in the military thing is just so much fun. I like uh, Barta today says, put, put, put us down by a high heel sniper rifle. Nay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you know, anytime hilarious. you're writing characters, uh, you know, police, military, even you can go as far as say healthcare, things like that, where they're dealing with the, the ugly shit, you know, you're going to find that gallows humor. Yeah, always because humor is the ultimate defense mechanism. And when you're looking at somebody that you know who got mangled or you get something horrible come through the ER or whatever, you have to. I mean, it's yeah. it's you've yeah. got to have that humor or it'll it'll just it'll eat you up inside. And I feel like the humor for like a fantasy soldier is is a little bit different from say a military soldier. I mean, like let's look at the evolution of your mama jokes. Your mom <laughs> is a classic staple in our humor. So you could imagine that, you know, over the course of a few hundred years, it could have evolved to a much more, you know, like a higher state of, of insults. Whereas in, in fantasy, you can't really do your mama jokes unless, unless you do them really, really well. You know, you craft them like a fantasy joke. So, right. you know, going with the humor, but honestly that it, the dialogue has been so easy because, 
you know, once, once I'm in the head of the characters, it's easy, you know, it's so much easier to write it because all I have to do is think about, you know, someone who I've met who talks like that, or, you know, when I do accents, you know, pretending to be someone or, or whatever it is, it's so much more fun in a way to be able to do that. Like, uh, in my second book, terminal secrets he goes back to his home planet and i kind of imagined his home planet like a georgia or an alabama or a texas you know <laughs> kind of like this country good old boy country and so being able to write the kind of stuff that they that they say there is just it was just so much fun it's like uh what's that movie with uh reese witherspoon uh, sweet home alabama we don't, yeah when she comes <laughs> home from new york oh nice one baird yo mama of valor they actually <laughs> shot that pretty close to a place i used to live no, oh, nice. <laughs> one of the one of the most fun things about me for sci-fi is the naming, the naming conventions. So, um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Guy Ritchie and his names. Oh yeah, but just, uh, just he's the director. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He yeah. does Lockstock, Two Smoking Barrels, Snatch. He did The Gentleman. Like every single movie of his has people with ridiculous names. Mm -hmm. And I loved that more than the you know than the actual movies themselves is just the fact that someone walks around with a name like that. And so being able to write that into, into my story, like the opening scene, the guy is taking, you know, the, the main character, Nolan, he's citing on someone whose name is German French. What kind <laughs> of ridiculous name is that? You know? <laughs> but being able to write that and, and it's just like, it's just a name that someone might have come up with, you know, in the future, being able to do stuff like that uh, is something that you can't really do in fantasy. I mean, you can have a little bit of fun with it, but not as much. Well, I think uh, in fantasy, though, you're since you're creating this whole new world, whole new culture, so on and so forth, you know, it's it, it's harder to, for those things to relate because you don't have that common ground that you have in in the in a real world science fiction setting. Right. You know, so the humor is much more difficult. You get you better off in fantasy with like slapstick and that kind of thing, you know, the yeah. more more physical g gags as it were. <laughs> Rick you, you said, know, Rick said the naming convention got canceled. <laughs> <laughs> He's on a roll tonight. That's I awesome. I think he met one bottle, not one shot. Yeah. yeah. That sounds more like a one bottle thing. Um, you know what's funny about the names is that in the the last Terra Nova book, I was just listening to it on audiobook. Uh when I always my my biggest problem with writing sci-fi is tech jargon. Okay. Like coming up with cool like names for the whatever. Um, and one of the funniest things I've ever written is that I took you guys see that uh, that YouTube video that they did back in the I was probably in the like the early, early 2000s, late 90s, where this guy is talking about this mechanical thing it does nothing but everything he says is like super super technical the words yeah. mean absolutely nothing right like the retro encabulator uh flossum thing that vibrates shimmy what like so i took the the text of that and like chopped it up and used it as my techno babble for one of the nice. scenes where this like brainiac kid is trying to explain what he's doing to this Marine and everybody's looking at each other going, is he really speaking English? Like what is he saying? <laughs> it was great. That's awesome. I, I forgot that I had let it run so long when I wrote it. And then I'm listening to the audio book and I'm like, yeah, man, he's really laying it on. That's really good. <laughs> and you know, this is one thing that I've enjoyed a lot about, about science fiction. So with fantasy, you, you, kind of have to take the whole world aspect a lot more seriously mm. because of how you know quote unquote unrealistic it is you know yeah. it's much more mystical much more magical much more you know fantastical whereas in sci-fi as long as you keep sort of the through lines fairly consistent it's realistic to understand that technology that we know will have evolved to us to varying degrees so as long as everything feels you know fairly normal right. You can get away with a lot, and so yeah, being yeah. able to play with that um, for me has been has been a lot of fun playing with those things, and and um, just just you know including pop culture in in funny sort of tongue in cheek ways, like in the in the book four, um, the character he's he lives above a strip club. He's going out, wheeling out the back entrance and a bunch of guys sort of try to, you know, dodge the bill and he takes him down. And then the club owner walks up and she basically gives them the Godfather speech. 
you know the one the one from from the original godfather you know you come into my club on the day of my my daughter's <laughs> wedding and you ask me for a favor right, and, right. so basically i watched that whole scene and i like i i i didn't copy it verbatim but i yeah. made it you know just so much like that and so <laughs> And of course, the guy is getting a kick out of it. And at the end, he's like, "Really? Were you actually trying to channel the Godfather?" And so, being able to 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 throw in these things, not not excessively, right? But but you know, just right, like um, Pierce Pierce Brown in the Red Rising series. Oh yeah. Um, at one point, I think it was in book four, he has this moment where two characters are facing off, and this character has, you know, has been named as the knight of something for the whole book. And then it turns out that her name is Felicia. So the whole the whole point of that scene of everything about that thing was to set up the moment where the character See, kills her and says, "Bye, Felicia." Bye Felicia. <laughs> oh my and gosh! That, and that cracked me up so hard because I would never have seen it coming until that exact moment, and I right. knew exactly what he was doing yep. as soon as he did it. And so being able to do things like that in sci-fi, <laughs> that's good. It has like been that. so much fun. <laughs> Um, well, if you're, if you're not in the live chat, then you're missing all the, uh, the shenanigans that have, uh, that happen as always in the show. Rick Partlow says the psycho fractulator, uh, <laughs> and James says, don't point that at anyone. Of course, guy comes with a valor. He comes reference. with the best one. Yes. Valor vibrator. I'm going to put that <laughs> in a book. Definitely going to, that comes up with, uh, we had a, a panel, um, this afternoon with me. Scott, Richard Fox, and Jonathan Brazzy, Chris Winder, and J.R. Hanley was running it. And they get to this part where we're talking about, I don't even know what happened. And J.R. was like, well, now that we're talking about silicone bedroom instruments, Winder, you're up. And we're like, what? <laughs> it was hilarious. I don't even remember what happened, but it was pretty funny. Um, <laughs> I, I, think, I think one of the things that I like about uh, writing mill sci-fi and actually that that keeps me writing it is uh, the the ability to do like dramatic really cool dramatic things um, in the in the in the the guise of like um, uh, when Iron Man comes out of somewhere and he lands on the ground and you have this boom and he looks up and you have like a rocket like that visual is cool to me yeah. and i like being able to do those kind of cool visual i mean you could do them with fantasy like gandalf coming over the mountain on the third day or the morning or whatever like you could do that stuff but yeah. i think um in a lot of military sci-fi it it presents opportunities to do that kind of cool dramatic stuff do you in and, and and i know that your your books don't focus wholly on the sniper aspect of it because you're focusing on the character but do you have instances where um the sniping mission is just kind of background for what else is going on that you have some dramatic things happening that don't have to do with the sniper aspect of the book yeah absolutely so the the challenge of writing a story about a sniper is to make it interesting and you can't you can't really keep it fully interesting through a scope because there there are no you know there's you're lacking that textural element you're lacking the sights and the sounds and the smells and because you're so far away so it's always about finding a way to get the character into a sniping position and then also play with them up close and personal and so you know mm -hmm. sort of going between the two and so yeah i can i can pretty much do anything i want where you know maybe the sniping shot is the really intense moment where he's like in in assassination protocol I have the scene where he is literally standing on a motorcycle on the seat and the handlebars to take this like a uh, thousand meter shot, which it should be absolutely unrealistic and is absolutely unrealistic. But nice. because in the context of the world that I've created and his technology, his AI is stabilizing the bike and yeah. his armor has like locked onto the seat and the handlebars. So he's stable to take this shot. And nice. so, but then after he takes down the, you know, the spacecraft that he's trying to take down, he's got to get up close and personal to, you know, to hunt his targets down. And so being able to go back and forth between those things, because he's a sniper, but he's not only a sniper in the sense that, you know, snipers are trained for just about, you know, every distance of combat, literally. 
Um, so being able to play with that has been a lot of fun. And you get these amazing cinematic moments, like in in the second book, in Terminal Secrets, you know, instead of landing and disembarking from his spaceship, he just like pops open the cockpit and like jumps and does the superhero landing, you know, right in the middle of all the bad guys. Because it's yeah. like, why not? You know, why he's, not? Like, exactly. he's got this suit exactly. of armor, yeah. it can handle the impact, you know, do stuff like that. And so it's really, really fun. Like you said, fantasy does have the cinematic moments, but in a different sense of things. You know, you get like the the tide of monsters rolling over the over the mountains, you know, approaching right. the city walls. Or you have the people coming over the hill at the right moment or the sun rising, you know. Like the, it's it's a much more I would say it's much more beautiful cinematic. Yeah, it's more it's, it's more great. grander yeah. than, it's like the grand but than it is hard, swarm. fast, that, cool. Yeah. That arrow know. swarm, that in itself is a thing of beauty when you have yes. the arrow swarm or you have the, you know, the soldiers lined up in a perfect straight line with the helm right. screaming and all, you know, like, right. like there's that sort of beauty. But then with, with sci-fi, you get these cinematic moments like, you know, an orbital drop. You can have something like that guy. He's got to jump out of a ship that's in orbit and he's got to go through, you know, um, atmosphere, re atmospheric reentry and his suits burning up and, you know, what, whatever you want to do with it because of the technology, as long as you make it realistic, you can pretty much get away with anything. Yeah. yeah. I wrote a, uh, one of the, one of the scenes that kick off the, the final sequence in the last Fowler book is they, uh, they halo jump. And I've been trying to work the halo jump into the series ever since the first book. And it just so happened that I was able to do it on this last one. Um, but instead I actually of, I got one of those embrace court over three too. <laughs> it's a cool concept, right? But it's so is. Using, uh, instead of using parachutes, they've got exo thruster suits on that they can right. walk out of when they land. Um, oh, that's cool. Because they're, they, they, they basically are structured as a way to hold the body still. Um, so you can fly. Cause it's very hard to fly when you're like doing all this. So you've got thrusters and an exo brace suit that helps you navigate or, or fly down. And then as soon as you flip over, land on your feet and, uh, the suit opens up, and you walk out of it and then it folds back down. And uh, I, I, I love doing that kind of cool visual thing in, in yeah. sci-fi stuff. Now you could do that on in, in fantasy, have them fly on eagles or from Mount yeah. Mordor you know, or whatever. <laughs> there, are, there are some some moments that you can get, but but really, you know, like those big, you know, like a spaceship exploding in the middle of a city. You can't really do that in fantasy. You know, you can get volcanoes. You can do a dragon collapsing over. Right. It. right. But, but, you know, sci-fi is where you can get some of those really, really. And I think that's why science fiction does so much better um, in, in TV, and, like in film and TV and movies, because it's got these more visual cinematic right moments to it that we as you know as as viewers and readers we can understand exactly what's going on whereas in what fantasy is. you know that that wave of magic that's sweeping across the nation and you know killing everybody it's much more harder to visualize as opposed to you know like the the scene from the avengers monster sky coming towards me pretty pretty straightforward right yeah. and i also think it's a question of scale Yes. You know, in fantasy, you, you have a limited scale, but when you can start, you know, using up an entire planet's resources to build one giant spaceship, you know, the, the scale is so much larger when you've got the whole galaxy to play with as opposed to a few kingdoms or whatever. Absolutely. You know? I do have a technical question from the live chat from uh, Silent Wolf about um, your mailing list. And uh do you do you separate your mailing list out for your sci-fi and your fantasy, or do you keep them together? And have you seen any positives or negatives from swapping those genres out? So before, like, I, I knew I, I I knew I was going to release the series early 2020. So I started in late 2019 or or in January of this year to build up um, a mailing list exclusively for sci-fi. So I started off by presenting it to my readers. I say, look, I've got. Uh, all of my fantasy readers I said, I've got this prequel that I wrote for the series that's going to come out, the book zero. It's free to download. This is the only time I'm ever going to pitch you anything sci-fi. If you want, if you're interested in sci-fi, download the story and it'll automatically, you know, automatically add you to the sci-fi mailing list. Okay. Um, if you don't care about sci-fi, just totally ignore it and we will continue being, you know, happy fantasy people. And 
you know, I think I got about 400 and some of my subscribers going. So I have a specific list called sci-fi existing, which means all of sci-fi, you know, fans who I know also read my fantasy stuff, they join this list. So I know that like for, for the also bots, that list will have a lot of fantasy, um, you know, purchases in there. So I don't want to have, you know, them buy the book right away. I'll want to wait till later on. Right. But then since doing that, I also started running lead generation ads on Facebook, just $5 a day. But, you know, over the course of four months, that adds up. And then downloading, you know, again, same prequel book to download and then doing, you know, book funnel story origin promotion, stuff like that. So between all of that, I've gotten up to around 2,500 subscribers um, since the beginning of this year or since the end of last year. And I have never pitched these subscribers the new ones, uh, anything about fantasy. It's always been focused on sci-fi. And I will never pitch them anything about fantasy. I will keep it exclusively to sci-fi. And for my other list, I will keep it exclusively to fantasy. Do you have plans to go back and continue to write uh, fantasy at some point? Or do you think that this switch is uh, more permanent than not? Well, I owe my readers another seven books in the Assassin series because uh, the first story arc, it was it was originally a complete story arc of six books. But then after I hit that story arc, I realized that there was more story that I needed to tell. So I, I needed to do um, seven or eight books for that second story arc to close everything and to to bring closure to his story. And, you know, it ties up a lot of stuff going on in the world. It's going to bring in all of the other characters from the other series um many of whom have you know like the young adult series up until the the second to the last chapter had like no um effect on his world and then in that second to the last chapter they re- they discovered something that changes everything for the other character and so like i've got to do that and then all of my new story ideas are in fantasy because that's what i've been thinking about for you know five years if sci-fi i mean i'm having a ton of fun on sci-fi the fact that it's been seven months and i'm seven books into the series and i've got another six more to write is proof of how much fun i'm having with it and how you know how how much there is to tell so it's kind of like when I get to the end of this series, I kind of have to figure out what I'm going to do next as both, uh, you know, from the creative standpoint and then from the, the business standpoint. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I'm hoping, uh, I, so I want to do the, my detective novel, which is right now it, it's not, I don't have plans to do a series. It's just like a one-off deal. And then I would like to, to work on some sci-fi stuff, but I really wanted to, to work on fantasy and I, I'm, I'm really excited to get into that, but I'm also um, not really nervous, but anxious to see, you know, because I know how well my mill sci-fi stuff does. And I, 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 I have a reader base there. So I'm really anxious to see what happens when I come at a completely new reader base with, you know, something. Because I, I mean, I haven't seen, I've, I've co-written some stuff. I've written in a lot of different universes. Um, so I've got, you know, fans in multiple areas i uh, really haven't seen a lot of crossover in those spe- like coming from my terra nova stuff to like galaxy's edge or galaxy's edge to valor like i haven't haven't seen a lot of crossover there so i'm mm-hmm. really interested to see and i'd like to talk to you more offline about like building that specific mailing list and and getting those readers front loaded into your world so to speak so that when yeah. you release the the new book and the new genre you're not starting from scratch trying to build a whole another thing yeah well that's that you know that prequel novel comes in um you know that book zero like i wrote it because i knew i wanted to build a new mailing list and the only way to do that before releasing something is with a giveaway like that so so instead of waiting until i had the book released and you know having those organic signups in you know from the the back matter or front matter doing this thing in advance three months was you know is, is a short lead in time if you're thinking of you know releasing your first fantasy book in 2021 you could write that you know that prequel now yeah. start building that list and over the course of the next year you know you could hit 5,000 subscribers and that's all people who have proven that they like fantasy they like the idea of your fantasy and you've engaged with them um however often monthly weekly semi-weekly um and that you know, they'll be primed when that book finally comes out. Yeah. It's actually, it's a really good idea. 
I like Jake Clifton's uh, title for that mm-hmm. fantasy book, uh, Arthur Conan Conan Doyle of Valor. I'm going to be really disappointed when I'm not writing Valor anymore. And you guys better keep up the Valor memes. <laughs> in order to the live chat. <clears throat> uh, well, we are coming to the end of the hour. Um, we've we've talked a lot about your books. I'm I'm curious. You said that you have 12 books lined out for this series. Yep. Um, you have three of them up for well, two of them up for pre-order. There's three available. Uh, are you doing the rapid release the every 30 days for the the books, or how are you doing the the pre-order launches? That's that's the plan. Um, Athon Books is publishing it, so they're the ones sort of doing it. There is thir- uh, 28 days between one and two, and I think there's 32 days between two and three. But um, book four is already submitted, and the first round of edits are done. I should have it done by this week or early next week, and that one won't be coming out until June. So there's plenty of time for that. Book five will be sent to the editor. Um, probably next week and I'm finishing up book six now. So like I, 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 I work pretty far out in advance with the idea of making this rapid release possible because I know as, as a reader, I hate waiting. So I don't want to have to wait even a month for that next book. You know, if I loved a book, I'm going to just dive right into the next one. Like I binge read or listened to the, the red rising series. And now I'm super pissed because I've got to wait. I don't know how long for book six. Yeah. I've read the first book in that or listened to the first book in that one i haven't made it to the other ones but the first book was really good oh, holy crap it was brutal dark Whoa. as all hell like Man. like uh, the hunger games on steroids like yeah. dark and that for me was just like absolutely addicting i was not ready for it like i i didn't know anything about the book when i started listening yeah. to it i just thought saw that it had a whole bunch of reviews and i was like okay i'll give it a listen and tim gerald Renner just narrates it and he's yeah. a fantastic narrator but man, it, they got to the where they were killing each other and like a whole bunch of other like holy crap. <laughs> book two, book two, the end of book two has the the biggest holy shit plot twist moment that like that I have read since Malazan book ten. Like it was just like it blew my mind that he would go that dark. Like wow. at the end of the book, it's dark. You already know that all these people have died. There's been so much loss. There's been so much horror and nasty stuff. And then in the last chapter, he just boom, no, a ball, a dive bombs it. And it's just like, what just happened to me? It was amazing. <laughs> you're, you're like, what? He's like yeah. giving everybody the finger. Like, no, <laughs> no. Uh, no, like, like Pierce Brown is a master of the plot twist. Like there's, you know, aside from all of the other stuff of his stories that is super interesting, he can do a plot twist like very few other authors that I've ever read. I have to put it on my my uh, TB, TBL, my TBL, TBL. So I'm getting ready to finish. Um, uh, I'm, I'm listening to uh, what am I listening to now? It's a Michael Connolly book. It's uh, the long, uh, the late the late show. It's uh, oh, yeah, the Renee Ballard. Yeah, Ballard. Uh, the late show, and then I'm gonna do the the second book in the Three Lost trilogy. Uh, but da, 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 before they were hanged. Oh, the yeah, good. Joe Abercrombie is a freaking beast. Yeah, no, I've got I've got the new one and uh, a little hatred. Yeah, screwed up. Yeah, oh god, yeah, great books. Uh, Andy, thanks for coming back on the show, man. Uh, it's always me. a blast to have you on, and um. We'll have to count up and see how many shows you've actually been on and get you like a prize for the next. Yeah. Time. And if I don't have the record, I will be, I need to have the record. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's the thing for Plus. me. I'm, I'm super competitive at very, very specific things. <laughs> you'll, you'll break into the feed next week just to yeah, get an absolutely. appearance. Like he's like, excuse me, guys, yeah. I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, like uh, what's his name on uh, The Shining? And he's got an axe and he's coming. <laughs> Here's <Scott> Andy. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Uh, everybody in the live chat, thank you guys for coming and hanging out with us tonight. It was a blast as always. Your Valor memes were fantastic. Let's see. There was a couple. There was a roll. Valibrator uh, the, or, or whatever yeah, it was. The, the, the Valor Vibrator. There you go. Of uh, v- Valor of Depression <laughs> into Valor. Into Valor is actually nice. Actually, that's pretty I good. Like that's... I, had, I had one the other day. I wrote it down on an envelope. Where did I put that at? Absolute Valor is the one I found on the uh, envelope. The the end of Valor only works if he's going to turn into a coward in the story. Yeah. Like, nope, that's it. I'm that's out. It. Or he dies. <laughs> We're done. And, oh, and he, or he dies. That's true. Um. So let's see. I don't know what the girls have going on on Thursday. Let me pull up the calendar and see. 
uh, Walt Robillard is going to be on uh, Concepts and Coffee tomorrow morning on the Facebook group if you're curious to hang out with him and drink coffee, which I always am if I'm awake because I'll be <laughs> up late, late tonight. I'm considering doing a um, maybe next week or, or, or late this week doing a writing stream and just having people come and hang out with me while I'm writing. We'll see. This uh, this whole quarantine thing's got me screwed up, and uh, I need adult interaction time. <laughs> well, maybe kids, maybe, kids maybe you and I could like could like write tandemly. Yeah, and you could make me feel inadequate. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm cool with that. I'm cool with that. <laughs> I don't know where my calendar is. I can't pick it up. Thursdays is the writing journey. Uh, Lauren Moore and Kayleen Williams are talking about something. They had the CEO of. Um, prove it on last week. That was a really good show. Perfect it. Perfect it. Perfect yeah. it. Um, let's see. Did I miss anything in the live chat? No, I did not. No. Okay. We're going to wrap it up tonight, guys. Thank you guys for hanging out with us. As always, if you haven't subscribed, please do so. Share us around. Get us some eyes on the show. We need to get to a thousand subscribers. I don't know how many times I have to say it. <laughs> Make up fake email accounts and subscribe right now. <laughs> Go do it. Pretty sure YouTube will like ban you for saying things like for that. No, don't like do that. that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't, don't do that. Do that. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thank you guys for hanging out with us tonight on this Monday night. We're going to come back next week. We're going to talk about some reading. We're going to talk about some writing. And of course, everything in between right here on Keystroke Medium. Peace. Hey, guys. Bye.